My walks take me to every corner of Britain as I seek out history embedded in the landscape. In this country, you're never very far from mysterious ruins or the shadow of unwelcome visitors. So from romantic moors to majestic peaks, I'm really enjoying some serious walking. Each of my walks leads me through a different time and a stunning location to find the stories you can only really appreciate on foot. This time I'm in the West Country, marching in the footsteps of a rebel army. In 1685, this rural area was the scene of one of the most remarkable uprisings in English history. It's a story that's very seldom told, but it ended with the very last battle on English soil. The ragtag army had one goal, to topple the last Stuart king. From the Jurassic Coast to the Somerset Levels, my walk this week shows off much of what we love about the rural West Country. But I've come to explore the tumultuous summer of 1685. A rebel march, the Battle of Sedgemoor, and the infamous Bloody Assizes. 17th century Britain had been consumed by civil war and anti-Catholic persecution. But by the time of my walk, one man had had a long time to restore order. Charles II reigned for 25 years and should have guaranteed a stable Protestant future. But a long marriage to Catherine of Braganza had failed to produce a child. Instead, heir to the throne was Charles's brother James, a confirmed Catholic, and that spelt trouble. The West Country would soon be the stage for a new national crisis. I'm climbing Golden Cap in Dorset, the highest point on the southern shoreline and a standout feature of the Jurassic Coast. Walking here in 1685, I could have seen the arrival of my walk's lead character, a man who set himself up as the nation's saviour. That man was James, Duke of Monmouth, who was also the illegitimate son of Charles II. In June of that year, he set sail from his base over there in Holland. He sailed across the channel, past where I am now, and headed off in that direction into the Dorset town of Lyme Regis. I'm setting off on the little-known story of the Monmouth Rebellion. My walk sets off through Charmouth and heads towards Lyme, where the Duke of Monmouth first landed. Further west, I'll find out how this remarkable coast has changed on my way to the Axe estuary. Inland on day two, I'll visit rebel towns before marching to the East Devon Hills and the campsite of Monmouth's growing army. Into Somerset and the region's power players come into focus before Monmouth enjoyed a rapturous welcome from the people of Taunton. On my last day, it's Bridgewater and the army's route across the Somerset levels. The Battle of Sedgemoor was the decisive clash with a legacy for the whole country. Back on the south coast, I'm following Monmouth's voyage to Lyme. But to find out what drew him here, I need to uncover the big issues of his father's reign. Charles II was lucky to have been king at all. The Royalists lost the civil war to Oliver Cromwell in 1651, and Charles fled through here, Charmouth, on his way to exile. But in 1660, the people welcomed him back, and he reigned for quarter of a century. So I'm meeting Professor Justin Champion to find out why the country remained deeply unsettled. What was it about the way he ruled that they disliked so much? 
This is still a very hierarchical society. Everything in the world is invented by God in a particular order. It's in every Shakespeare play. Everyone will know their order and degree. And Charles buys into that. He really goes overboard on claiming his divinity, that he's appointed by God, he's top of the hierarchy, he's next to angels. This absolute approach to kingship followed the Protestant tradition set up by Henry VIII. But by 1685, absolute monarchy was synonymous with the hated French Catholic Louis XIV. People genuinely thought that Charles was a Catholic, didn't they? They did, and he didn't help himself. He, he associated far too much, in one sense, with people who were recognisably Roman Catholic. And he was a little bit of a libertine. He looked a little bit like Louis XIV. So what was the problem with being a Catholic? What, why couldn't you be a Catholic king? There'd been a host of Catholic kings here and abroad over the centuries. The backcloth to a lot of the anxiety about a popish absolute king is that there's a French superpower that's liable to come and destroy English Protestantism. So it's a little bit like a religious Cold War. And that anxiety, it's difficult for us to really um, capture it. If we were Ian Paisley, you can still hear in his no popery um, commands that absolute fear that, that a Catholic king is infected by the Antichrist. So 25 years previously, everyone's cheering, hooray, 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 Charles has come back. But now, 1685, the temperature's changed completely. There is an absolute fear that if the next king of England is to be a Roman Catholic, we're in deep, deep trouble. Thanks a lot. Fantastic. See you again. February was the month when fears became real. Charles II died suddenly aged 54, and his Catholic brother duly took over as James II. The events of my walk would now unfold remarkably quickly. Two centuries ago, I could have reached Lyme via the beachside prom, but these cliffs have become some of the most dangerous in the country and the coast path today takes me 800 metres inland. I'm heading towards the Duke of Monmouth's landing site, but what do I actually know about him? He was the illegitimate son of a very young Charles II. I know he was a Protestant and that he was about to make a big impression. As I reach Lyme, I've arranged to meet the author of Monmouth's new biography to learn some much needed details. Who was his mum? So his mother was called Lucy Walter. She was 18. Charles met her during a really short window, just two weeks, when they overlapped in Rotterdam in 1648. And Monmouth was the product. What was she like? She was very beautiful and very beguiling, and she worked her way through these kind of dishy young exiles, <laughs> but also ultimately quite a nasty piece of work. She had been found attempting to murder her maid by jamming a knitting needle into her ear and was bringing him, Charles II, into disrepute. Eventually, Charles had had enough and made several attempts to kidnap his own child. And he finally succeeded when Monmouth was seven. And in a terrible, terrible scene that was reported across the courts of Europe, his officer literally tore the boy, the seven-year-old boy, from his mother in the streets of Rotterdam. What was the impact of this, this bastard child on the court? The king adored him. And that would be the absolutely overwhelming dynamic of their relationship, because he had all of his mother's beauty, none of her sort of viciousness, and Charles II gave him an absolutely top title. There were only seven dukes in England, so to make this 12-year-old boy a duke was a, a real affirmation of his love for him. Like Wills and Harry, he was put in the army, wasn't he? He was, he was. To everyone's complete amazement, because he had no training, he was a tremendous success in the army, but he rose to be Lord General, which means he was in charge of the entire English army. So he was brave, he was good-looking, he got this fantastic personality. He must have had some flaws. He loved to be loved, um, and that, I think, came from his relationship with his father. Also, he loved to look wonderful, and he spent an amazing amount of money on clothes, and he knew that he looked fabulous. On the other hand, he knew that that was one of his attributes, and he knew how to work it. Anna, I have a feeling you rather like him. <laughs> I do, I do. 
In June 1685, just four months after his father's death, the 36-year-old Monmouth sailed up the Channel. His mission was simple, to topple his Catholic uncle James II. But he came to Lyme with a quite pitifully small fleet. One 32-gun frigate, two fishing boats, and just 83 men. Like today, he'd have been confronted by the harbour wall, known as the Cobb, which has welcomed everyone from 14th century sailors to Merrill Streep in The French Lieutenant's Woman. The Cobb had been fortified by cannon in the time of King Henry VIII, and as Monmouth wasn't sure what kind of reception he was going to get, he decided he wouldn't enter into Lyme that way. Instead, he came round the other side to this beach here, which is now called, surprise, surprise, Monmouth's Beach. The Duke needn't have worried. He was in for a very warm welcome. Monmouth, resplendent in green, arrived on the beach and called for silence. Then he dropped to his knees, kissed the ground and thanked God for a safe crossing. Then he unfurled his sword, he was really hamming this up, wasn't he? And led his men into the town. In front of them, there was an unfurled banner saying, fear nothing but God. The crowd must have been stunned. They now knew who this visitor was. A Monmouth, a Monmouth, the Protestant religion, some of them cried. 60 Lyme men pledged their support straight away. But for everyone else, there was a recruiting desk set up at the town hall. A declaration was quickly published to deliver the kingdom from the usurper and tyrant James, Duke of York. This was now an act of treason and there was no going back. But before I leave Lyme completely, I need to find out why Monmouth's mission had to start here. In 1680, a few years earlier, Monmouth had come on a sort of profile-raising trip, a sort of progress to this part of the world, and he'd had the most amazing reception, and people were cheering in the streets, and there's an amazing description of a girl, a young girl, who had scrofula, which is a sort of glandular disease that it was believed the royal touch could cure you of, and she grabbed his wrist, which was bare, and she held it, and he said, God bless you, my child. And she went away, and a few weeks later, she was completely cured. And this was published in a pamphlet that was circulated all over England, you know, which demonstrated that, yes, he was, in fact, you know, the true king. In the West Country, at least, Monmouth was a 17th century pin-up. I'm pressing on west of Lyme along the Jurassic Coast stretch known as the Undercliff. These cliffs have changed beyond recognition since 1685. Major collapses in the 1800s produced first meadows and now, since the decline in sheep farming, entirely new and almost untouched woodland. This is just about the only place around here that's sufficiently light for me to be able to show you these. They're reproductions of playing cards which were very common in the late 1600s. This set is about the Monmouth Rebellion, although it's told very much from the royalist point of view. They're fairly bloody, as you can see from that one. And this one is the Duke of Monmouth entering Lyme with 1,500 men. It's a bit of an exaggeration. It was actually less than 100. I'm not going to show you anymore because I'll give away the whole story. Monmouth dispatched his aides along routes like this to spread word of his arrival to local towns and landowners, many of whom the Duke had stayed with back in 1680. I've now reached the Axe estuary and the end of my first day. Back in Lyme, though, Monmouth was preparing to move his band of rebels out across the region. Now he was in the West Country, Monmouth was banking on the news spreading. He hoped that other disaffected regions would rise up, support him and distract the Royal Army, which would otherwise come down into the West and confront him. But for now, 
Well, at least he got Lyme Regis pretty well sewn up. It's my second day in the West Country, following the Duke of Monmouth's bid to topple James II. But so far, I've got very little impression of the people who are going to help him do it. So I'm heading inland to the rebellious town of Colliton, before joining Monmouth's march north through Axminster and along the East Devon Hills. The West Country of 1685 was a powerhouse of the national economy. Cloth and wool were big business, and Colliton was one of Devon's commercial hubs. But I'm here because it was the most rebellious town in the region. Joining me in Colliton is something of a modern rebel, once known as the Bard of Barking. These days, Billy Bragg is a local boy with a lot of empathy for Monmouth's rebels. From History calls this rebellion sometimes the pitchfork rebellion, but actually the people who went down weren't agricultural labourers, they weren't working in the fields, they were mostly what we might call today artisans. You know, they were tailors, carpenters, uh, masons, people like that. 105 men, a quarter of the adult males of Colliton, quit the town to follow Monmouth. These people were devout Protestants, but followed a modern, stripped-down approach to worship that was as far removed from Catholicism as you can get. This is revolutionary sponge, this, you know. Uh, Monmouth would have eaten this kind of stuff. <laughs> it must have been a massive decision for those guys to go off on the march, you know, leaving home, yeah. making all those risks. Why do you reckon they did it? Well, they were nonconformists, rebelling against uh, James II's Catholicism, but you have to understand in the 17th century, religion was politics. Mm. The people who were going down there were going down there because they don't believe in the hierarchy that's come back with the Restoration, and also because they're, they're aspirational people. They want the opportunity to get on in life, and I don't think they'll get that. We're talking about people from Somerset, people from Dorset, Devon. Some even came from London. There was a guy named Daniel Foe involved in the rebellion, who later changed his name to Daniel Defoe. The Daniel Defoe? The Daniel Defoe was involved in the Monmouth Rebellion, yeah. These rebels were impressive. No longer would they simply accept a king's divine authority. They believed a monarch must uphold the will of his people. And they were prepared to fight to achieve that. Monmouth was the popular Protestant figurehead they needed. And after four nights in Lyme, he was on the move. His force now numbered around 1,500, and he marched them inland. At this point, the king declared Monmouth a traitor. The Lyme Regis Declaration was ceremoniously burnt in public, and the unimaginably large sum of 5,000 pounds was placed on the rebel duke's head. It's not a bad view, is it? It's the Axe Valley sweeping all the way around there into Axminster. That's the view that the rebels would have had. And Axminster was the first key point they were aiming for after Lyme. Also aiming for Axminster were the county militias of Somerset and Devon. These were part-time, locally trained regiments set up as the first line of national defence. But the Devon militia commander feared his men might be ambushed by rebels hiding in hedgerows and cancelled his advance to Axminster. The Somerset militia, though, did turn up here, although it was in dribs and drabs, whereupon absolutely no fighting took place whatsoever. Either the Somerset men tactfully retreated, or just as likely, they changed sides and joined the rebels. 
The malicious failure left the rebels triumphant. They moved swiftly through the town and headed to the hills in search of a suitable camping ground. There was to be no camping for Monmouth, though. He headed straight to a manor house that's remarkably unchanged since 1685. I've asked permission to drop in on the present owner of Coxton Hall. This has always been the dining area. That was the original parlour next door from where we've just come, and then you've come through into the banqueting suite. These two pillars here are Elizabethan, and they were almost certainly here when the house was first built in 1590. So the Duke of Monmouth may well have sat in this room and had a meal. Bound to have done. Monmouth didn't just put his feet up here at Coxton. He persuaded his host, Richard Cogan, to join his rebel force. This is the master bedroom. This has always been the master bedroom. So he'd have slept here. I like these panellings. Yeah, that's an Elizabethan gallery. That's the original timbers. When built, it would have been glazed so that uh, you could look out onto the courtyard below. Or he might have looked through the window over there to see the sunrise coming up over a lovely old yew tree which would have been there because it's about 400 years old. It is a fantastic house, this. You're so lucky. Until the bill's come in. <laughs> <laughs> the Duke's followers, you'll recall, didn't have windows to look out of because they were camping. Nice view, isn't it? I'm heading north along the ridge overlooking the Axe Valley. This is where Monmouth's army came for their first nights out of Lyme. They settled on the highest point, Bewley Down, where I've made a rather special arrangement. Here, yeah, Paul, get your men lined up there. Let's have a look at you. This is the Taunton Garrison, who bring the events of summer 1685 back to life. Engineer Allen and teacher Mike are civilian rebels, typical of the men who came from towns like Colliton. Retired civil servant Paul, meanwhile, wears the uniform of the Somerset Militia, a new recruit picked up in Axminster, perhaps. Well, this is the kind of thing that you would have had in the camp, presumably. Yes, that's the simple fare that would have been available. Bread, cheese, butter if you're lucky, cider. That would be about it. But they really have been lugging barrels of cider along. Oh, into yeah. It's, it's sterile. It keeps the troops healthy because they're not drinking the water, which could be brackish, could be poisonous. So it was quite a tough life being a rebel. I think with Monmouth's army, the tent would be um, a great luxury. They had very few. But the rest of the guys would have been sleeping on the ground? On the sleeping ground. on the ground, yeah. sleeping in hedges. And if you're lucky, you might have a bit of canvas you could stretch over, give a bit of shelter from the rain, but most of the time open to the elements, really. At least half of Monmouth's force would have had access to a musket, many more a pike. But hundreds had to get creative with a scythe blade, essentially an adapted farming implement. There are surviving letters from the time that the royalists are absolutely terrified, quite rightly, I think, of uh, facing a weapon as terrifying as that. Now, we actually do think that Monmouth's men mustered here or hereabouts, yeah. don't we? Yeah. You'd have thought he might have wanted to put his men up in the local towns and villages. Monmouth would attempt to avoid actually billeting his army directly in the towns because of the damage they're likely to do, trying to find firewood. So it was a kind of hearts and minds exercise that you didn't want to hack off the local people, so you kept them away. Absolutely right, he wants to recruit them. He sent his quartermasters into the town to get food and pay for it, though he paid for it with scrip that uh, could only be redeemed when Monmouth actually had some money, when he became king. So if he didn't, they got nothing. Ta -da. Bye. The army was here for just 48 hours. Monmouth couldn't let them outstay their welcome. So, just like me, they quickly passed into their third county. Look, Somerset. In less than a week, Monmouth had beaten a path through Dorset and East Devon 
and met with remarkably little resistance. That's my overnight stop tonight, Chard, which presented the rebel army with another 99 volunteers. It seems Monmouth could attract all the tailors and shoemakers he liked, but what he needed was the West Country's really big players. I've reached the halfway point of my walk, following the Monmouth rebels of 1685. So far, we've seen rhetoric, enthusiasm, commitment, and an awful lot of scythes. But how can you take all that and turn it into something which can bring down a king? I've left the Axe Valley, and I'm following the River Isle downstream towards Ilminster and the key estate of White Lackington. Then it's west to the Somerset cloth town of Taunton, a triumphant high point for the rebel army. Monmouth knew that success could come in one of two ways. Either he could muster enough men and firepower to comprehensively thrash the king on the battlefield, or else he could draw so much support from all over the country that the king's ability to rule would just disintegrate. With well over 3,000 men, Monmouth's firepower was building nicely. But to win nationwide support, he needed some political big beasts on his team. Land and wealth still spoke volumes in 1685. And since his West Country tour five years earlier, Monmouth had believed that in Ilminster, he had important allies. Monmouth arrived here in Ilminster on the 17th of June, where he was met by Charles Speak, a member of a renowned West Country family. The Speaks were landowners, they were politically minded, they were non-conformist through and through, and they knew Monmouth well. Monmouth and the Speaks were ideal partners. He had the star status, they had the money and the connections. Just outside Ilminster, I'm heading to the Speaks family estate and its centrepiece, the rather charming White Lackington Manor. In Monmouth's time, head of the family George was MP for Somerset. The present owner, meanwhile, has written a history of the estate. George was a bit of a rebel, wasn't he? He was, and his wife, Mary, was even worse. The Bishop of Barton Wells said she was the most dangerous woman in the West. She was very ardent Protestant dissenter um, and held illegal religious gatherings, um, all for freedom, as long as it wasn't Catholicism. The Speaks knew Monmouth quite well, didn't they? They did. When Monmouth did his PR tour in 1680, he came and stayed at White Lackington Manor, for, popping in and out for all of his time in the Southwest. And the reason I brought you here is because on his first day here, he had lunch underneath this spreading chestnut tree, which isn't spreading anymore, of course, and he was being watched by 20,000 people, so the records say. The Monmouth tree began life sometime around the Norman Conquest. By the time of Monmouth's promotional tour, it was over 500 years old. It fell over on Ash Wednesday, 1897, and it's still lying there. Every little whirl has got a memory of a year. Probably one of those little splinters remembers Monmouth being right here. I rather like that. What kind of support did the Speaks give Monmouth when the rebellion kicked off? Not a lot, actually. Really? Um, no, no, really very little. George Speak, the old man, he said he was too old and withdrew. So they left Monmouth to his fate. This was a bitter blow for Monmouth, and the Speaks weren't alone either. Edmund Prido at Ford Abbey had welcomed the Duke in 1680. So too William Strode of Barrington Court. But when the rebellion came, their support largely evaporated. The problem was everyone knew James II was the lawful king. Four months into his reign, the gentry were still deciding just how bad he might be. Monmouth was far from buried, though. He still believed the people were with him. I'm following his progress across Somerset's Black Down Hills. 
This is a piece of traditionally cultivated grass meadow, but there's only 22 hectares of this kind of environment left in Somerset. Although in Monmouth's time, it would have stretched all the way, 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 way towards that hill beyond all those cultivated fields. The Barrington Hill Nature Reserve gives you a hint of the landscape back in 1685. The grass is cut just once a year for hay. But come June, and you'll find the place a home to wild flowers, even orchids. Monmouth passed through here safe enough, but his rear guard ran into a spot of bother. See this hill here, Barrington Hill? This is where we are, and if we're Monmouth's men, there's this little stream here which is at the bottom of this slope. About 20 of Monmouth's horsemen rode down and engaged with 20 other horsemen. This minor cavalry force was the vanguard of the Royal Army. A skirmish took place, fire was exchanged, and Monmouth lost four men on what is still known as Fight Field. James II had dispatched a cavalry regiment as soon as Monmouth left Lyme. It was commanded by John Churchill, a local man who'd once served as Monmouth's junior officer. His job was now to monitor his former boss and contain him in the West Country. But for now, Monmouth was on a high. He entered Taunton, the Somerset capital of merchant wealth, to the greatest reception he'd received so far. It's said East Street was so packed, it was difficult for Monmouth to make his way through the street. Flowers were thrown, and hundreds wore a sprig of greenery, the now accepted badge of the rebel movement. Overlooking Market Cross in the centre of town was a small row of buildings which are little changed today, except that now you can meet here for a coffee. What was it about Taunton that made it such fertile ground for the rebels? It was a place of great independence of spirit. It had embraced Puritanism, it was against the policies of the Anglican Church, and it was also a very prosperous place. And it was here on his second full day in town that a radical decision was made. Monmouth was proclaimed king. It's extraordinary, isn't it, that just outside this coffee bar, someone was proclaimed king of England? Well, yes, it doesn't often happen in a provincial town. The crowds gathered in their thousands. The whole of Taunton was there. And it was one of Monmouth's own captains who proclaimed him James, the new king of England. The status of king might help galvanise support from the West Country gentry, or so it was thought. But even some of Monmouth's officers weren't convinced it was a good idea. It's an extraordinary thing to do. It was high treason, the highest of treasons, and it was a very, very risky strategy. Believe it or not, this is where the Duke of Monmouth was proclaimed king. This is where the Market Cross used to be. Buoyed by his new status, Monmouth drove his army on. I'm following the River Tone on my way to the Somerset Levels. Monmouth, though, made a beeline for the key city of Bristol. But things didn't go his way. The brilliant June weather turned wet, and Monmouth's untrained, unprepared volunteers were getting rained on day and night. Churchill's cavalry stalked his every move, while to the east, the King's full army was now heading towards him. An assault on Bristol was now out of the question. So Monmouth played to his strengths. He returned here to rural Somerset. Tomorrow I'll reach the levels where the decisive battle took place. I've reached my final day following the Duke of Monmouth and his rebels across the West Country. After a night outside Taunton, the Bridgewater and Taunton Canal is my route into the Somerset Levels. But first, the canal will take me to the town that became Monmouth's final stronghold. 
Then I'll retrace the rebels' journey across the levels to their fate at the Battle of Sedgemoor and look at a legacy that was both bloody and profound. On the 3rd of July, 1685, Monmouth marched his rebels into Bridgewater. He'd failed to capture Bristol, and now, with the Royal Army just miles away, he was returning to rural Somerset, the bedrock of his support. The rebels were at a low ebb. The rain-sodden march to Bristol and back had seen hundreds of men quietly desert the army. But spirits were lifted with rumours that up to 10,000 farm workers in rural Somerset were now prepared to sign up. Through sheer numbers alone, this sort of offer couldn't be sniffed at. When Monmouth got back to Bridgewater, he found that the promised 10,000 men were more like 160 men. But ever the professional, he ordered his officers to drill the troops, defend the town, and get the weapons mended. His intention was to quit the southwest and march away from the Royal Army, past Bristol to Gloucestershire, where his hearts and minds exercise could begin afresh. The march north never happened, because the afternoon before, a local farm worker called Godfrey turned up at the rebel camp with news that the King's army was camped just four miles east of here at a place called Western Zoyland, deep in the heart of the levels. So Monmouth and his key men met here at St Mary's Church to make the biggest decision of the whole campaign. Monmouth took advantage of the best viewpoint in town where I'm heading now with my expert guide to the events of Sedgemoor, General Jack Deverell. Mind your step, Tony, because it's quite a jump over here. Cool. You can see a heck of a lot, can't you? It's a great view. If you look half right from where you are, you'll see some tall poplar trees and there's the grey tower of Western Zoyland Church. It's so near, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, three miles. Godfrey, of course, was sent back to find out the state of the King's army, and he came back with some interesting information. First of all, they had not put up any earthworks or dug any trenches. Secondly, it was clear they went in a defensive position. Monmouth seizes the opportunity, and he conceives of this very imaginative night attack. Monmouth's men were surprisingly heartened by this audacious plan. If nothing else, they still believed in Monmouth's brilliance as a military leader. At 11.30 p.m., they set off from Bridgewater in the dark. We need to understand that he brought 3,500 men, 3,000 infantry and 600 horses down this track. The column would have been somewhere between two and a half and three kilometres long. Monmouth's army actually outnumbered the King's, but he lacked weapons and training. His plan was to send his cavalry on a commando raid around the side of the King's camp to launch a surprise attack. But the Somerset levels strike me as one of the most puzzling places to fight a battle. There are huge wetland regions, crisscrossed by drainage ditches barely above sea level, and liable to flood, as we saw in February 2014. In the dark early hours of the 6th of July, 1685, the prominent Black Ditch was the rebel army's handrail. By keeping it on their left, they edged silently closer to Western Zoyland. As they crossed Langmore Drain, a shot rang out. Uh, it is not clear whether that was uh, an accidental discharge from within Monmouth's army, whether it was an act of treachery, both I think are unlikely. It was more likely that they'd been seen by a King's army sentry, and that was exactly the sort of bad luck that Monmouth did not need but he'd succeeded in getting just a few hundred metres from the enemy before they knew anything at all. The final challenge for the cavalry was the drain known as the Bussex Reen. Once crossed, they could charge straight into the panicking royal forces. But for whatever reason, they couldn't find a crossing point. 
When they failed to cross the Rhine, the cavalry commander turned the cavalry to the right and effectively marched them straight in front of the King's infantry, who were lined up in that field. So they were sitting ducks? They were, and they had about five or six volleys fired at them uh, from the King's infantry, and uh, they then panicked and bolted and collided with their own infantry, who were forming up in that field. So, uh, unfortunately, Monmouth's cavalry had done exactly to Monmouth's infantry what he hoped that he would be doing to the King's infantry. Monmouth's master plan was in tatters. He was left with musketeers and scythemen, many of whom, it was said, fought bravely and effectively for some hour and a half. But by first light, there was only going to be one winner. Almost a thousand of the rebels were mown down while fleeing inevitable defeat. Could he have won? He could have done. It was a very, very daring, very imaginative plan. I think it was more contemporary than the 17th century. He was badly let down by his cavalry commander. Had he been able to scatter the royal cavalry, I think he might have won. It is extraordinary to imagine, isn't it, looking out on this terrain now, that such a significant battle took place yeah, here. Yeah. Except every so often we are reminded of it because people fired musket balls. <laughs> 300 plus years ago, those were fired by people intent on killing somebody else. It's a sobering thought. 500 rebels were rounded up and brought to the village of Western Zoyland. They were tied together and led into the church. But Monmouth wasn't among them. With just two or three companions, he'd raced away southeast, disguised in the most basic country clothes he could find. In order to try and make sure that he wasn't captured, Monmouth went on alone, leaving his friends behind. But a couple of days later, one of them was picked up by some soldiers, and he told them where he'd last seen the Duke. It wasn't long before they found a yokel fast asleep in a ditch somewhere near Ringwood in Dorset, except that the yokel was carrying a star of the Order of the Garter. The search was over. Monmouth and the West Country had failed to change the rule of law and religion, and the justice meted out was brutal. Before they left, the King's officers hung 22 of the rebel prisoners from trees and gallows around Western Zoyland. As the army returned to London, so too did Monmouth to await the fate of a traitor. Look at this, a copy of the final letter Monmouth ever wrote when he was in the tower. I declare that the title of king was forced upon me and it was very much contrary to my opinion when I was proclaimed. Having declared this, I hope the king who is now will not let my children suffer on this account. And to this, I put my hand this 15th day of July, 1685, Monmouth. Later that day, Monmouth went to the scaffold. A month after the rebels had been defeated, the King sent his Lord Chief Justice, Judge George Jeffreys, down to the West Country to try the rebels. It became known as the Bloody Assizes. 1,600 people were tried in nine days. Over 300 were sentenced to death, 850 to transportation, to work as forced labour in the plantations of the West Indies. Across the West Country, hangings took place in public places, like Taunton, Monmouth Beach in Lyme Regis, and even the Red Post at the border of Somerset. And such brutal retribution did little more than prove everyone's worst fears about the tyrant James II. After four days and 72 miles, I'm ending my walk at Burrow Mump. <laughs> 
an ancient levels landmark, where the final stages of the Monmouth Rebellion are laid out before you. You see that spire, that's St Mary's Church, so that is Bridgewater, and over there is the church of Western Zoyland, just by where the battle took place. And way, 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 way over there is Glastonbury Tor and the march north that Monmouth never made. Monmouth's mistake was to rebel too early. Instead, he laid the stage for the real winners of this whole saga. His cousins. William and Mary, the Protestant power couple, came on their own mission to topple Mary's father. They invaded the West Country in November 1688, and support for James II simply disintegrated. The joint monarchs were crowned in 1689 and swiftly signed the Bill of Rights. The glorious revolution had occurred. So Britain secured its Protestant future and enshrined the notion that never again could a monarch rule without the will of its people. James Duke of Monmouth and his rebel army are now just a tiny chapter in British history. And that's really rather sad because although the rebels had different religious leanings and political opinions, I believe that above all they followed the Duke because they wanted to see a Britain that was ruled by Parliament, not by an absolute monarch. And in that respect, their legacy is very great indeed. If you want to follow in my footsteps, you can download a guide to my walk by going to www.channel4.com. Eight o'clock tomorrow night, the Great Wall of China. How long is it really? How was it built? Why did the wall evolve? Secret history promises answers. Well, next night when box office records were smashed, the monster film hit that deserved all it got, The Inbetweeners.